Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the pre-calculus notes for section 1-3, Continuity in Behavior and Limits, day one. Uh, there were, I think, two to three days worth of this lesson that we covered in class before we had a quiz. So these, this video lesson is designed to go back over that information in case you still need to work on it in preparation for your chapter one test at the end of the unit. So uh, this is going to be us filling out the notes from this day. Uh, these notes are available on Google Classroom. Continuity. Uh, continuity is uh, a continuous function, um, has no asymptotes, no holes, no gaps. Okay. In other words, what that means is you could graph the function without ever lifting your pencil. Okay. So for instance, with continuous functions, uh, any linear function would be a continuous function. Uh, we've done a, a large amount of work in our careers, that's a pretty terrible three, uh, with quadratic functions. Uh, we've got uh, absolute value functions. Those are continuous, okay, things of that nature. Discontinuous functions, uh, we've got a couple things that could come up. Uh, we've got square root functions because, for instance, uh, when we have a square root function, that function would have to uh, have its domain restricted. Uh, actually, no, that's that's not really a very good example of a discontinuous function because usually you can do that without picking it up. Uh, let's see, how about reciprocal functions? So like 3 over x would be an example of a reciprocal function. Uh, since the x is in the denominator, there are values of x that cannot be plugged in. That would cause division by 0. That would be a discontinuous function. Uh, rational functions. Okay, that, would, that particular function would have an asymptote, which would mean that it uh, is discontinuous, same as the reciprocal function. Very similar. Uh, you've got your uh, piecewise functions. that would probably have a jump discontinuity to it. So there are a couple different types of discont discontinuity we need to talk about. Uh, these are just some examples. So the ones on the left, 3x plus 4, 3x squared plus 4, the absolute value of x plus 2, those graphs don't have any asymptotes, they don't have any holes, they don't have any gaps. So they are considered to be continuous functions. Uh, the ones on the right, they have holes, they have asymptotes, they have uh, jumps, gaps in them, that creates discontinuity. So, there are a total of three types of discontinuity that we're going to be working with. Uh, you've got your infinite discontinuity. Uh, what that means is that the graph itself, whatever that graph may be, has some sort of asymptote. So, we're coming along, we're coming along, there's an asymptote, say, here, and the graph will come in and go out down the bottom and come back in up top. These two separate pieces of the graph is an example of infinite discontinuity. Uh, that particular example would be something along the lines of 3 over, I don't know, x minus 3. That would mean that since x is not allowed to equal 3 because of division by 0, that is where we have an asymptote. at the line x equals 3. Okay, So that's just an example. That graph probably isn't even 100% accurate, but uh, any time that we have an x in the denominator, we could very well have discontinuity. Uh, if that factor, x minus 3, does not cancel, then that particular factor is marking an asymptote. Uh, that is opposed to what we call removable discontinuity. I'll give an example of that. So here's a graph. We're coming along, we're coming along. Then we have a gap in the graph, and it goes off on the other side. Now, an example of this, and I'm going to try to give one that would be relatively accurate to the graph that we're looking at, uh, would be something along the lines of, let's go with just x plus, or x squared plus 5x, plus, or uh, minus 5x, let's go with minus 5x. 
squared minus 5x plus 6 over x minus 3. Okay, in that case, when we're looking at this and we factor the numerator and the denominator, the numerator factors into x minus 3 and x minus 2. So even though we still have that x minus 3 in the denominator, that value cancels. And since it cancels, x is still not allowed to equal 3 because that's division by 0. But this time, since it canceled, it marks a whole. Okay, so over here, we had this division by 0, but the x minus 3 did not cancel when we tried to reduce the function, which meant that it had an asymptote. Over here, the x minus 3 cancels, which means we have a whole. Those two types of discontinuity are usually seen in rational functions, functions where you have a numerator and a denominator that are polynomials. Uh, the third type is called jump discontinuity. So, for example, uh, this is usually, this is almost always seen uh, exclusively in piecewise functions. So, say we had the function this function right here. Uh, here's an example of what that function might be. So, that function would be something along the lines of f of x equals x if x is less than or equal to zero and f of x equals x squared if x is greater than 0. Okay? Uh, x squared will go plus 1. That way the graph will be somewhat accurate. Um, if we're to the left of 0, our function is a linear function, f of x equals x, uh, all the way over here to the closed circle at roughly uh, that value, whatever that is. Let's go ahead and make it x minus 2 so that it's more accurate. Um, and up above, we've got the quadratic section of the piecewise function. Those two graphs are two separate pieces, and we can't trace it without having to pick up our pencil here and set it back down to continue up above. So that would be a jump discontinuity because it jumps from that negative value up to that positive value. This is seen exclusively in piecewise functions which we've spent some time talking about already. So we're going to look at some examples. Here we go. Uh, here we have a graph, and we're asked to find all of the discontinuities and classify each one of them by type. This graph has three discontinuities to it. We have a discontinuity here at x equals negative 1. Okay, We'll write that up here. At x is equal to negative 1, we have a removable discontinuity. Okay? That is a whole. Anytime we have a hole in our graph, we quote that x value as being a discontinuity, in this case a removable discontinuity, because a removable discontinuity is a hole in the graph. Here is our second discontinuity in the graph. We'll call this part two. The second discontinuity at x equals 2, we have an infinite discontinuity. Okay? This is because we have an asymptote at that location. See the dotted line? That is a line that this graph cannot cross. If you notice, we go down here. Then we have to pick up our pencil and reappear up at the top to finish tracing the graph. Our third location, our third discontinuity is here at x equals 7. That third continuity at, or discontinuity at x equals 7, we have a jump. And this is all about... Um, the limits, which is something that's not really familiar. Um, essentially, the way that this works is if we look at that graph and we look at what's happening on that graph as we approach x equals 7 from two different directions, those are not equal. The limit of the function f of x 
as x approaches 7 from the negative side is equal to uh, positive 3. That function is approaching the y value of 3 as we approach from the negative side. And that is not equal to the limit as f of x approaches, as x approaches 7 from the positive side where the graph is approaching 1. So since those limits are not equal, that indicates a jump discontinuity. Okay, so here is an example where we don't have a graph. We're still expected to be able to do the same thing. This is very similar to early in the chapter when we were looking at the domain of the function. We look at the denominator because we should know immediately that this cannot equal zero. Okay? So what we do is we figure out what values are not in the domain. We ask ourselves x squared plus 8x plus 15 what values is that not allowed to equal because that cannot equal zero? We factor it. It factors into an x plus 3 and an x plus 5. Numbers multiply to 15 and add to 8. Which means that x plus 3 is not allowed to equal zero and x plus 5 is not allowed to equal zero. Okay? So we can't use the value negative 3 and we can't use the value negative 5. They are not in the domain. Now, the other thing we have to do, though, is we have to check to see whether or not those values uh, cancel. So we've already talked about how the denominator factors into x plus 3 and x plus 5, and that's the reason why we can't use negative 3 or negative 5. Um, up above, the top is a difference of two perfect squares. x squared minus 9 factors into x plus 3 and x minus 3. Notice that we will, should, in theory, be able to reduce that function by canceling the x plus 3. What that means is that since x plus 3 cancels, x at negative 3 is a whole, a removable discontinuity. Whereas x is not allowed to equal 5 is an asymptote. Okay, so we have two discontinuities to state. We have x is not allowed to equal negative 3, which is a whole, a removable discontinuity. And x is not allowed to equal negative 5, which is an infinite or asymptote. This is how we always approach rational functions. We consider what values are not in the domain, just like we did earlier in the chapter, and then we decide whether or not they represent wholes or asymptotes. If the factor cancels, it is a whole. If it does not cancel, it is an asymptote. Finally, in example three, we have a couple of piecewise functions. We're being asked to determine whether or not the functions are continuous at x equals three. And essentially, the way that we do that is we plug three into both pieces. Those two pieces must be equal value. Okay? So we start by saying, okay, 2 times 3 minus 1 is 5. That's the top piece. That is technically equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side. Those limits, the positive and negative limit, as they approach 3 from each side, have to be equal if the function is going to be continuous. Okay, so we start off with the first piece, then we plug into the second piece, which is 3 squared minus 4. That would be 9 minus 4, or 5. That is not only the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side, it's also the actual value of f of 3. Notice that the function is defined at f of 3 because I'm able to plug 3 in, and the two limits are equal. So since f of 3 is equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side of f of 3 is equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side of f of 3, those are all equal. So we would say, yes, this function is continuous at x equals 3.
Now don't get caught up in the notation. Notice what we did there. All we did there was we checked to see if it worked in both pieces. And if those two pieces were equal, then it is continuous at that point. So let's do the other one here. I'll change colors to purple so we can see where the, where the values change. The first piece is 4 minus 3, or 1. Again, that is the limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side. It is also the value of f of 3. So the function is defined at 3, so we don't have that issue. The other one is 3 times 3 minus 7, or 9 minus 7, which is 2. This is the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side. Notice that our two values, which represent our two limits, are not equal. Okay? Our limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side of f of 3 does not equal the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side. So this is discontinuous at x equals 3. Okay? All right, that does it for our first video. Thank you for your time.